Alright, draft physics video presentation. Um, subject of just the basic function uh, functions of the universe that it really is doing very little um, fundamentally. And that sort of will relate to things like uh, radio meter, <laughs> right? Um, in terms of um, mechanisms to kind of illustrate that um, the idea of an absorption and a reflection uh, is kind of a um, you're thinking about it the wrong way because they're both doing the same thing it's just one is doing it a little bit slower you know storing a little energy first heat um, which becomes equalized and then they're both essentially the same thing over a period of time and how this relates to momentum and all that kind of stuff so the basic idea the only principles involved in the universe is that you bring a force in and essentially an exchange is done with the object, the electron or the proton, and a force comes back out. So an exchange is made for this, for that, and the consequence is this electron moves or this proton moves. So this is um, the only thing that's changed is that the movement of this will be slower than the movement of this little object. Um, and all you can do is change it back to going the other way. So there's no neutral position. You can't make an electron stop moving. You can only make it either change direction or you can accelerate its speed. So I can make one that's already going this way, make it go faster by hitting it, or um, it can be coming the opposite way and I can slow it down a notch but I can't go to zero. The electron never stays still. So electrons and protons are always vibrating. Um, they're always changing direction. They're always going some direction. Every direction, frankly. I mean obviously they can't go every direction at the same instant of time but they're every instant they are have a bias in the three dimensions um, in one of the two up or down they're either going up and down or they're going left and right or they're going forward and back so they're going forward up and left or they're going forward up and right or they're going some combination of those things but they're never going nowhere in any of those dimensions and the only thing that keeps them in a place is the fact that there's an equal amount of energy coming from all directions, from all dimensions, um, basically containing them with a pressure. So maybe that's where I should have started, um, is that this whole conversation um, is about um, understanding, when they use a word like, say, they use a word like field. The field isn't a thing. Okay, the field is the force. So when they say there's a force present, they'll call it a field, like the electromagnetic field. So they're saying, well, there's a magnetic field, an electric field, and gravitational field, and uh, you could say a quark field and an electron field. No, there's only one field. It has this energy in it, these little bits. And they come in black and red. They come in proton uh, reflexive and electron reflexive. So you could just understand them as X and O's or something, but regardless, that part only becomes important uh, in the subject of magnetism and dipoles and all that stuff. Um, but the basic idea that is, is that all you can do is either give an electron, change its momentum um, as a consequence of force, or if it's the wrong force, the proton force hits an electron, the force is just diverted. So those are the only two things that happen. You give an electron a change in its momentum, or you just change the direction of the force in some perpendicular way. In, out, up, down, however you want to look at it. And that's it. That's all the universe is doing. So everything is built out of the analogy that I used. <coughs> you could think of it as a bunch of uh, boat rowers in an ocean. And they're swimming. And then there's boats that are the electron and the proton. And the boats contain a certain number of seats. And in this case, only five seats. 
No, if it was four seats, then you could have two and two. You could have two going forward and two going back, and you wouldn't be going anywhere. But if there's five seats, and then you're stuck with three and two no matter what you do. You can't cut it in half. Um, so the electron would always have a motion, either going forward or be going back, but you couldn't just have the boat sit. Um, and the idea is, is that when a rower jumps in the boat, the opposite rower is given back to the field. So he has to jump out of the boat. So if it has forward momentum towards you, then you can make that momentum weaker, one rower weaker, or you can reverse the rowers. But that's all that can happen, is those very few things. And I would argue to you that every experiment, every phenomenon of fields can be understood as just, this is the field. The field is this stuff in motion, the photonic type energy. And the boats are just the electrons and the protons. The only ones that are significant. A, n a neutron, let's just for the sake of argument, call it a composite particle. It's made of a proton and electrons. Two boats stuck together. Yeah, that was another subject I... I <laughs> all right, so I'll go there for, for a moment. All right, so the idea with, of a neutron is that it's a, an electron and a proton. So I'll make the electron small and the proton big. And I would argue that what happens in an atom is that you have you know, the two protons and one electron between them, and all the proton energy goes out the electron, all the electron energy goes out the protons, and so you end up with a very low pressure, and so these two protons can get very close to each other. And But if the neutron is by itself, so if the neutron is connected to a proton, this electron is really close to the proton, all right? Really close, if it's in an atom. But if you take that neutron out of the atom, you take it away from the other extra proton, this electron is going to be much further away. Um, you know, um, in, in consequence, because now you're not reducing the pressure as much. Um, it can be much further away. It's more vulnerable, let's just put it that way. Um, because this system creates lower pressure than this system alone. Okay, well, anyway, yeah, um, it's probably more of a subject that I want to do in this video. Uh, but that would explain why the, the neutron falls apart. Um, because there's more chaos uh, for the neutron thrown into the real universe uh, versus being in its protected world of having the extra proton. Anyway, um, so back to where I was. So field is just a word for the little swimmers. And they're really a force. Okay, they they impose a change in the electron's momentum. So every time an electron runs into a swimmer or a swimmer runs into an electron, there's an exchange made. So it's always a pressure argument. Um, so um, force uh, is is what a field is made out of. The field. Let's see what did I write down? Is pressure. Um, <laughs> let's see. I did say something as, uh, you know, um, pressure. So you can either make it more pressure or less pressure uh, by adding or subtracting swimmers, by putting more swimmers going this way, uh, you know, than going this way. Obviously, if something's here, he's going to get more exchanges this way and be giving away more swimmers that way, then he'll give away this way, and the boat's going to go this way. I mean, Obviously, it gave away those swimmers. It's going to go this way. Um, no, not very complicated. It's all just pressure. Pressure created by what's well, theoretically a push by the swimmer, but in a way it's just an interaction. And the more interactions you have on one side of you than the other side of you, inevitably, uh, is going to cause you to be pushed uh, to, ex to absorb that um, bias. Um, all right, absorption and exchange, it's always an absorption, it's always an exchange, and really the key thing is going to be just the time. So what I would argue is, is that the interaction of a reflection versus an absorption, so the difference between the mirror side and the black side of the surfaces, let's say, um, where we think it makes a difference, in a lot of ways it just really can't make a difference. 
because all that's going to happen is there's force. We're saying it's hitting an object, okay? Um, and there's what's called a reflection, you know, and this moves. Now, the only question is if this moves a lot, that is, the electron keeps moving, well, that's heat. So if the electron moves a tricky path, um, that would be what we'd consider to be heat. It's a storage of the movement, the momentum. So the energy that went in got stored, um, but eventually it's going to come out in a direction. So it could come out this way, and the electron will be stopped from going this way, and it will give up a piece of energy going that way to switch to going this way. Um, but uh, in this dimension, is the one that's relevant, the idea would be as the electron even travels to the other side and then gives back the energy by making an exchange again, where it absorbs a piece of this external energy and now has a momentum in the opposite direction and it gave back this swimmer. So this original swimmer is returned at some point. And all we're really arguing is a reflection means you gave it back sooner. All right. An absorption means eh, it took a little while before you gave it back. So there's a time difference before you gave it back. But it's going to be exactly the same circumstance. There's nothing's really going to change because all this is not a destruction of anything. This is just a delaying of something. So once the surface heats up to equilibrium, a pure reflection and a you know a silvered surface and a hot surface are going to be doing exactly the same thing. They're going to be pushing, putting back the energy they got. They're going to push something one way. The system's going to fight back eventually because it's going to the electron's going to hit more stuff coming at it than with it by inevitability, <laughs> and so it's going to end up giving it back, and it just depends on whether it takes any kind of interesting path before it does that. Um, depends on how far it goes, really. You're just saying a reflection is the electron moves one step and does the give back, okay? So it, the electron moves, gives back the energy, or the electron moves and it doesn't give the energy back till now. So it just really has to do about how far it goes before it gives back the energy. So this is a, a hot thing, and this is a cold thing. Or this is a reflective surface, and this is a absorbing, absorbing surface. Just has to do with a bit of time difference in when the energy ends up coming back by making the exchange of hitting another force and you're going to hit more force. Again, if you're moving into the force, this is the drag argument. Ironically, the drag argument used to defeat um, particle theories actually makes perfect sense because that's exactly how electrons and protons behave. They behave as if they have a drag problem. They can't get anywhere uh, without inevitably being stopped and prevented from going anywhere. It's very hard to um, eject the electrons out of a substance. Not very hard, but hard, difficult. Uh, because there's going to be that rebound. So there's theories you could have about how this takes place with, uh, say, a reflective surface. I've made the point that what I think is happening with reflections and polishing surfaces and making them shiny is that you're taking away the irregularities of the surface, which really means you're taking away where light hits um, well, I should draw that line straight just to... So you're not hitting a straight surface. So if you're not hitting the straight surface, you end up diffracting the light. And depending on what angle you hit, where you hit, that angle is going to be different. So you have these compound angles, and so essentially you end up with a bunch of scatter inside the surf the substance. And that scatter means the energy can bounce around quite a bit in terms of causing electron momentum and it just creates heat. And you'll never get an image out of the other side of the surface. An image isn't going to pop out of here, a coherent image of what went in here because you're hitting an irregular surface. So the smoother these atoms are, 
that is the more the electrons and the protons are all lined up perfectly um, you know I'll, I can just do it here just make the electrons smaller uh, obviously the spacing is always going to end up having to have a geometry to it electrons and protons are going to force some sort of symmetry in the geometry because the electrons are repelling each other the protons are repelling each other and um, you know, then the, you have the mutual the attractions between the electrons and the protons that are balancing this whole thing. And so it's the same rules are going to apply for each section. Each section is going to have the same rules, and so each section is going to end up trying to do the same thing. So if you give it a little bit of polishing, you're basically just saying, let's perfect that geometry. Let's take where this section had a, you know, one, one piece could have an electron and then a proton and then a, an electron, and then this other section is proton and electron. So this would be sticking out. So this would be like your crooked surface, where this alignment is the alignment where you're more likely to have the transmission, where this off alignment, where the electron is you know, in some other position, um, you're going to cause a a distorted momentum and you end up with a diffraction. So you need the electron to be in a precise location to get straight exchanges between the electrons. The pool ball has to be in the right order for you to hit a pool ball into a pool ball and then that pool ball hits another pool ball and that pool ball bounces to this pool ball. And to you know have the energy transition um, there has to be an alignment. If I make it crooked and I don't hit the balls in the center, you know, I don't hit them I'm not saying anything about curvature of electrons here. I'm just using this as an analogy. But if you don't hit the, if you hit the, if you don't hit the ball in the center, and hit it on the side, you're going to screw up your kinetic reaction, and this ball is going to go off in a different direction. It's not going to go the same way the ball that hit it went. So if I hit it off center, you know the momentum's coming in this way. Then this one's momentum is going to be in a completely different direction. They're not going to exchange the momentum in the same direction. Same energy will happen, but there won't be the same direction happen. And clearly, this ball won't stop where this one was. It won't take its place. So for one ball to replace another one, this one has to not only be spinning, not spinning, you know, no spin. It has to, or little spin, um, rotation. Um, it has to hit the center of this one. If it doesn't hit the center, then the, the this one's still going to have momentum because there's not going to be a quick enough exchange. Any direction change takes time, and so the you know that takes means electrons didn't take the shortest path. That means that there's a, a lag time, and that lag time means that you can't exchange all the energy as fast as you need to for this ball to replace this one's position. Um, yeah, this is probably, uh, you know, I'm going a lot of, far afield, a lot of subjects here. Um, I just want to get to the basic point that a field is force. A field is an, ex it causes exchanges in momentum. And the force is what's doing the exchanging. The exchange is happening between objects moving the speed of light. The force is, the field is always made out of this stuff. There's no field without something moving the speed of light. And the matter bits of the electron and the proton, um, which are absorbing the energy, essentially, of these bits. And based on how much energy is hitting them, more are coming this way or more are coming this way, they will end up with a bias movement in that direction. And they always have a bias anyway. But obviously, this will switch their bias if they get hit with enough energy in the opposite direction through their travel. So, but those are just the the key elements. Um, it's not any more complicated than that. That's all you need to know. And all those three blocks, you know, spell out the whole alphabet and build anything you want to build. They're they're the core to the whole thing. Um, you don't need to know any more to understand every process that takes place because all that's really happening is uh, energy in the form of those little bits of energy 
is being absorbed by matter and the matter reacts appropriately based on whether it gets hit by more energy from one direction or from another. Uh, oh, geez, there's always something that, no, this thing's making noise. Sorry. Ugh. Crickets are a problem for some people, like I said. I'm sorry about that, but tough. Um, all right, let's see, I do have notes here, but I should have wrote them down. I haven't computerized them yet. Um, atoms are um, dipoles. Okay, so the other point is, is yeah, as I've pointed out, there's two versions of the force and there's two versions of the matter. So you just have to, you know, it's not a big, huge deal, but it's really a really big deal if you want to understand polarization. So the force comes in two colors, and the matter comes in two colors. And the opposites, the opposite rules for the opposites. Um, so black force reflects, that is, it's absorbed, <laughs> okay, um, which is a reflection. Okay, and absorption is a reflection, and this momentum is kept. And then if, you know, red force hits an electron, it just comes out some other way. And if black force hits a proton, it just comes out some other way. But if red force hits it, like across here, that force will just keep reflecting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that gets us back to the radiometer thing. And um, so for this particular um, device for measuring radiant energy, I guess you could say, like photons or other forms, I suppose, radio waves or microwaves or whatever. Um, the situation is, is that when you put it in a complete vacuum, you know, that is when you have the, you know, the dark side and you have this, uh, the reflective side, you have this thing, this notion that somehow one of these sides should get moved more than the other. But there's such a little difference. The only thing different they're doing is this one, it's like this one is a little bit thicker. <laughs> okay, the dark one, and all it's really doing is it's the, there's a little more distraction before you get the heat, the energy reflected out again, and it doesn't matter which direction. So the key thing could be is that you could say the silver side always throws all of its energy back out this way. So the the light hits it and it all goes one way. It couldn't matter if there's nothing here to reflect it. If you can't cause a reflection, which direction the energy comes out in is inconsequential. So that's why the only reason why this thing will start spinning is because it's dirty. It's not a vacuum inside. And so what it's doing is when it's reflecting the energy, one surface is reflecting the energy, um, throwing the energy back more off one surface than the other surface is. One surface is radiating it as heat in all directions, and the other surface is radiating it as um, um, uh, energy uh, from one in one direction more, and so that's your difference. Uh, so it's so it's it's like it comes in one way, all going in this way, and it all leaves that way, versus the other side where it comes in all going this way, and it leaves really has to leave the same way, so I really can't argue that it can't leave the same It has to leave the opposite way, so it's, I, I, I gotta think of a better way to say it. It just takes longer for it to do it. it. Takes it, it has to get up to thermal equilibrium before it can do that. So there's a slight bias. Um, but the only reason why it works, they, they theorize, is that you need the other atoms to cause exactly what I'm saying. Reflections. They need something to cause it, the energy to be pressurize to cause more pressure on one surface. And now you can cause more pressure is to cause a reflection with something else. It's not the fact that you're reflective. It's the fact that something else exists to reflect it back to you. So if you're a ping pong paddle, it doesn't mean anything if you know you reflect it back and there's no other paddle to hit, the energy's lost. But if there's another paddle, um, you, know, you can understand that now the energy is going to just keep going back and forth and you're going to get, keep getting hit by that same piece of energy in a sense. I mean, it's, they're all going to be transfers, but the point is, is you're going to get hit a lot more often 
in this circumstance than in the circumstance where the energy just went, just was free to go. Um, there's going to be fewer interactions. And again, interactions, the number of interactions, inter, well, forget about spelling it, uh, <laughs> the, the number of them, the number, this is energy. You increase the number of interactions, that's that's somebody jumping on the boat or jumping off the boat. Uh, same event, really. One event can't happen without the other. So that's just a, an exchange on the boat. So the more exchanges on the boat, the more direction changes, the more what you could call heat or the more energy in a system. It's just like adding more force to cause more... It's like saying there's more swimmers in the ocean. You know, if you're having more people jumping on your boat and jumping off of your boat, um, it's like there's more swimmers. And so it kind of, when two things get in proximity to each other, it's like they create more energy out of the same number of swimmers. It's like they're multiplying the swimmers because these swimmers are jumping back in and out of the boat faster than the field ones can do it at a, at a higher density. So, this gets to uh, photons and their creation, which is another argument about density and frequency. And so in a way, you could argue that there may be a way to tell how dense the f energy, the field of gravity is. Like how many of these little bits of energy there are may be deducible from understanding that there's a rate at which an electron loses its momentum. So you give an electron momentum in a direction. It moves into the field of bits. It's inevitably going to hit more stuff going this way than this way. And it can't catch up to the stuff going the speed of light, quite obviously. So it's going to hit more stuff coming right for it, heading into it, than moving away from it. Um, so it's going to slowly get dragged. It's going to lose its momentum because it's hitting more things going against its flow, its movement than things it can hit going with its movement. Less of this photons hitting it from the back are going to be fewer than the photons hitting it uh, from the front. And it, it's going to, each time that happens, it's going to eject a rower. And the rate at which it ejects those rowers, uh, that is, it loses its momentum one quanta at a time, one rower at a time. Doesn't make exchanges, doesn't exchange ten rowers all at once. So it has to do them all, each one at a sequence. So it runs into a piece of force, it loses some momentum, which means makes an exchange, so it gives back. And then it crashes into another one, gives back another piece of its momentum. So let's say it had ten momentums in this direction, that is, it has ten rowers going this way more than it has going the opposite way. And you can understand that you could slow it down, you know, you go from 10, then you go to 9, and then to 8, and 7, and the idea would be, as you could see, that this could very well duplicate the frequency of photons. So the faster the, the, faster the electron is moving, the faster it's going to make these energy ex exchanges. So the faster it's moving, so what you have to kind of understand is the distance between 10 and 9 is going to be smaller because the electron is moving faster than the distance between 9 and 8. It's going to be a slight difference between those and then the difference between 8 and 7. And so you can get kind of the idea that you know, this has the smell of creating frequency because the density of the field is essentially going to dictate the frequency of the uh, ejected um, swimmers, uh, the rowers, and such. All right, let me take a little break. It's starting to rain, which is good, so we need some. And uh, I might have to do something. All right, let's just uh, sum up. 
Um, so the important point is that fields are nothing without the force. If there's no force, there's no field. It's just, you know, that, that's just the way it is. <laughs> okay, and the, the force is a real thing made up of little bits of stuff that have momentum. The momentum, that is the ability to be a rower, um, they row when they're on their own, and then when they get into a boat, they cause a net effect on a boat. So the rower, when he's in free space, you can understand he's just rowing and he's moving just fine. When you can find him inside of a boat, then it's going to matter whether there's another rower going the opposite way, because those two will cancel out. Um, then it just depends on how many rowers there are in the boat, and if it's if the universe is odd, okay, let's just say, just like when they say, oh, the universe is flat. Well, could be that the universe is either odd or even. Well, I'm arguing the universe is odd. And I would argue that the difference between electrons and protons is, is that electrons are odd, okay? <laughs> electrons have five rowers, let's say, and protons quite possibly only have four. So protons are much more likely to be stable in their position because they can have, you know, two going this way and two going this way and have a net zero and um, be stationary where electrons just can't do it. They just, there's just no way you can do the math. It's either it's three and two. Okay, you just can't. It's either three you know, or two, and there's no other way of getting around it. Or it's five and one or some other version of lopsided, but it's always lopsided. And so that's another way of seeing the distinction between proton behavior versus electron behavior, is electrons have this jitter problem and protons don't because they can just say I got an even number of guys going both ways I'm fine um, they can settle in a location and electrons just can't even though there's equal forces on both sides they're going to keep doing heads or tails heads or tails heads or tails protons can just sit on the edge not flip either way they can just sit in between and so in an even field, the proton is just sitting here, where the electron is going as fast as it, at a frequency. It's, the electron is flipping at a frequency that is as fast as the density of the force. That is how thick the force is, how much distance there is between the little bits of energy that hit all the time at regular intervals in irregular amounts and that's why there's a it can go oh, a little long way it can jerk a little way it can jerk a little a lot a little, but always even it out you can go three this way and then two back and then five this way and then six back the other way you know so anyway we don't wear that sort of stuff but anyway yeah enough but this is this is all you need it does the whole story of uh, mechanical function in the universe. You don't need any other elemental parts. You just need two kinds of force and two kinds of matter. And we have those uh, in the sense that people already accept the electron and the proton and charge. All you need is a mechanism that creates an inverse effect that is a, an effect that causes high pressure versus an effect that causes low pressure. And I've already explained that is if the red ones are hitting you, something different's going to happen than if the black ones are hitting you. <laughs> if the red ones hit, they just leave going that way. If the black ones hit, you end up moving that way. Well, I shouldn't have done that in red. Um, and that's all there is to this. Not complicated. So, enough. Till the next time. I mean, I'm not saying it's not complicated. Um, Gets, there's a lot of nuance to it and I'm trying to get it all in your head uh, this exchanging idea but to me it just seems so obvious that that's what's happening momentum is absorbed it's just obvious and if you absorb it and keep it you keep moving uh, you know and that is you have a mechanism that keeps you moving you make a motor out of your force <laughs> um, if the force is chaotic you're not going anywhere you're just going to go back and forth all right, I think it's enough of, of a video. So till the next time, I don't know what the hell I'll title it, but anyway, just 
some more draft stuff. Yeah, that's it. Mm, so, until next time.